All right, we're recording. Welcome everyone to this uh, research presentation meeting on uh, poly poly polyester polymer concrete overlays for bridge decks. Um, we have uh, Dr. Spencer Guthrie and the student Robert Stevens attending to present on this research, which I think they presented on several times over the past few years as the study has uh, progressed. And we're glad you can all join us as, as TAC members. And um, we're recording this today so we can share it with other TAC members that weren't able to attend and then others who have interest. I think primarily what our goal is today is to uh, essentially get a, a, a summary again of the of the research and just refresh our memories on that as well as uh, as what we uh, reviewed the uh, final report a few months ago, gave feedback and hopefully, well, my understanding is that's being uh, incorporated in the final report that we will publish soon. And then we can, so, so I think the presentation will go about 30 minutes and then we can have some Q&A and discussion of implementation and use of this uh, uh, system for overlays. And I guess maybe before we hand it off to BYU, uh, Cheryl or, or anyone else on the TAC, do you have anything to say uh, regarding the study or I guess any questions before we get started? I don't have any. All right. Great. Well, I uh, will hand it off to Dr. Guthrie and, and uh, Robert Stevens. Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm, my name is Robert Stevens. I, uh, up until just very recently, I was a grad, grad student of Dr. Guthrie's at BYU. And the title of my presentation is Polyester Polymer Concrete Overlays of Bridge Decks. Before I begin the presentation, I'd like to just take a brief moment and express my gratitude and appreciation to UDOT for giving me the opportunity to participate so so deeply in this research. It's been a great experience for me, both, both personally as well as scholastically and, and professionally. I feel that I've learned a lot and this has actually been the main thrust of my of the work I did for my doctoral dissertation at BYU. And so this has been a really good opportunity for me, both, both from uh, a scholarly perspective as well as practical application. Uh, in addition, this has given me the opportunity to work with Spencer, with Dr. Guthrie quite uh, extensively outside of school. Um, I, I'm involved now since graduation with his company, Infrastructure Research. and. So this opportunity, this has not just been a research experience, but it's really been um, a pretty important opportunity for my for my advancement and my learning, and it's been a springboard to my to my career. And so I just again like to express my appreciation to you all at UDOT for for allowing us to to participate in this. Um, I, I've been involved with this for actually about five years now. And so this has been quite extensive. The other thing I'd like to say before I jump in is that through the course of this presentation, due to the time limitations that we're under, um, I'll, be, I'll be presenting very high level. Um, I won't be going down into the details of, of test procedures and results as much. Of course, the full scope of what we did is included in the, in the UDOT report. Um, and, but, but feel free, of course, if, if there are you know, questions or details that, that don't get covered in this presentation, feel free to make a note and I'd be happy to delve into the to the details afterwards during the Q&A ses session. So with that, I'll go ahead and begin the presentation. I'd like to start with just a brief overview of, of the presentation here. I'll begin with a background on bridge deck overlays in general, and then we'll move to some background on PPC specifically. I will next review each objective that was identified for this research. And finally, I'll summarize the main contributions of this research, and we'll finish with a, with a Q&A session at the end. So, so to begin, we'll start with some background on just bridge deck overlays in general. As most or all of you probably already know, uh, reinforcing steel, otherwise known as rebar, is required on bridge decks. Rebar is essential for the structural reinforcement of the of a bridge deck. However, it is susceptible to corrosion, which is caused by exposure to water, oxygen, and chloride ions. 
Here's a little animation that shows how chloride ions can come into contact with reinforcing steel inside of a bridge deck. When salt, uh, de-icing salt, is placed on the deck, it will come into contact with water, and that salt will dissolve. And one of the components of the salt is the chloride ion. And as it's dissolved into the water, those chloride ions will either diffuse through the porous matrix of the concrete um, slowly or through cracks that develop in the bridge deck quickly. But in either case, they will eventually, some of those ions will come into contact with the rebar inside of the deck. And so this little animation demonstrates how that would occur over time. The really big downside to rebar corrosion is that it results in a five to 700% expansion as compared to the parent steel. In other words, the, 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 the rust is five to seven times greater in volume than the parent steel. This expansion, of course, puts the concrete in tension and results in delaminations or internal cracking uh, within the deck. And also, you know, those cracks can eventually reach the surface. In this picture here on the left, you can see that not only have we has the rebar experienced corrosion and the resulting expansion, but it has produced an internal delamination that has progressed to the point that we've seen potholing form on the surface of the deck. And so obviously this is something that we want to avoid. And so bridge deck overlays are used to protect bridge decks from these corrosive elements of, of water, oxygen, and especially de-icing salts or chloride ions. Historically, bridge deck overlays have been constructed using a variety of materials, including asphalt, silica fume concrete, latex modified concrete, as well as various types of polymer concrete, including epoxy, methacrylate, and PPC. One key requirement of overlays is that they must be durable and they must be able to resist debonding. That is an essential piece uh, or requirement of a successful overlay. Here's a picture of an epoxy coated deck that you can see here with my cursor, I'm just highlighting a couple areas that were delaminated or debonded. And in this case, we would consider that a failure of the overlay because it's no longer providing the protection from those corrosive elements. And so even though the overlay looks like it's mostly intact, um, those areas would constitute a failure. Here's an up close view of an intact overlay. In this case, we're looking at PPC as opposed to epoxy. Um, it's, PPC is similar, it's a similar idea to epoxy, but it goes down about twice as thick. And the mixed design, of course, is, is different. And so it's, it's a similar idea, but a different product. So I'll, step, I'll, I'll go through just a little bit of background on PPC specifically. Polymer overlays in general have been used since as early as the 1950s. Caltrans began using the version of PPC that we use today in the early 1980s. So PPC actually has been around for, for some time now. Um, it's, we're, we're approaching 40 years of PPC use on, on bridge decks. The, the motivation for this research, for this pro, uh, project, is that UDOT is, is currently increasing the use of PPC on bridge decks in, in Utah. PPC has, is, like I said, it's, it's a similar idea to an epoxy um, or, or an, another type of polymer overlay, but it consists of a polyester rather than an epoxy resin and natural aggregate. And as I mentioned before, it goes down, instead of three eighths of an inch, it typically goes down about three quarters of an inch thick. PPC has a lot of advantages. It's long lasting. It can last up to 30 years when it's, when it's constructed properly, designed and constructed properly. It is impermeable to water and chloride ions, which is a really essential requirement for an overlay. It also has some other advantages for construction. It cures rapidly. It's lightweight. It has a very thin profile. It offers high skid resistance, and it can even be used to restore ride quality in some cases. PPC also has a few disadvantages. It's, it's very expensive. It produces toxic fumes, and it requires very experienced contractors, careful mixture design, and close monitoring during the construction process. 
So with that background, I'd like to now step through just a, a review of each objective. Um, this research had a total of five objectives that I'd like to, to quickly summarize. So the first objective was to compile a synthesis of information about PPC from the literature. PPC has over the years actually been researched quite extensively. However, many of these existing syntheses are incomplete. They cover various aspects of PPC, but they, they don't offer a comprehensive review. Uh, many of these syntheses also, another limitation they have is that they focus on polymers in general uh, rather than PPC specifically. So there is a deficiency there. To address that deficiency and accomplish this first objective, a comprehensive literature review was performed. Uh, this, this lit review covered polymer overlays, as well as the history, advantages and disadvantages, chemistry, composition, material properties, design, construction, and testing of PPC, uh, specifically PPC for bridge deck overlay applications. The outcome of the first objective was uh, we produced a synthesis of existing information about PPC bridge deck overlays. Again, something like this had never really been done, at least not even close to as complete as we did. So we felt good about that. The second objective was to conduct a scanning tour to observe PPC construction and inspect in-service PPC overlays. This second objective was based on the need for information about construction, quality assurance, and performance of PPC overlays. Um, it's been done for many years in California, but in Utah, we, we, had a, a, we have a unique set of, of climate constraints and uh, you know, construction procedures. And so we, we wanted to get some firsthand knowledge about how PPC could be applied to bridge decks in Utah. There was no documentation of scanning tours related to PPC prior to this research. And so we, we set out on a scanning tour to, to California to learn more about how they do it there. Our, our trip um, was comprised of a three-day visit to California. The scope of the trip included discussion of selected topics related to PPC with Caltrans personnel, uh, inspection of existing overlays in the field, and observation of an actual PPC overlay placement at the Los Angeles International Airport. So here's a, uh, just a few pictures from our trip. In this uh, first set of pictures, our team is in the Caltrans Materials Laboratory in Sacramento learning about materials, equipment, and procedures related to the testing and acceptance of PVC. There's a couple familiar faces you can see in, the, in that first picture there on the left. Here's just a couple pictures of their, of their acceptance and quality control testing that they perform in the lab. In the left is a picture of a resin demand test. On the right is a picture of a tensile strength and elongation test that they perform uh, in their lab there. Here's a couple pictures of us in the field. Um, in this case, we're observing some bridge deck overlays that are on the I-80 corridor, uh, just east of Sacramento, California. Here's a couple more pictures uh, from our trip. Again, all these, we, we, we visited a number of, I think it was a total of five different bridge decks, and they were all on the I-80 corridor between Sacramento and Truckee. That was actually really valuable for us because these decks are in an area that, we, that we'd consider closer to an alpine region, which would be similar to the, to the climate and some of the types of trafficking that Utah decks might get. This next set of pictures is from the bridge deck overlay placement at LAX. Um, you don't think of LAX as having a lot of bridges, but there's, there are these elevated uh, structures that are adjacent to the terminal there. And, and so they actually are basically bridge decks. And so these structures received uh, PPC overlay during our trip, which was really good timing for us. So I'll just step through these really quickly. At the picture on the left, we have a deck that's been patched and prepped for a PPC overlay. And this picture on the right, uh, we have, you can see there's a worker that's running a shot blasting machine. He's actually just shot blasting that little strip uh, between an existing overlay and the sidewalk uh, adjacent to the terminal. This next picture on the left is interesting. It just highlights the difference between an unprepared deck in the, with the dark concrete on the left and a shot blasted deck that you can see is it's much lighter in color. 
Next picture is pr workers uh, priming the deck prior to the placement. Um, here we have a mixer truck that's feeding some material into the paver. And then finally, we've got workers that are actually placing and finishing a PPC overlay. Here's a worker that's doing some quality control testing. In this case, he's using a Schmidt rebound hammer to measure the hardness of the overlay right after it's placed. That's, that's done for opening to trafficking. This picture on the right, you can see, is, a, is the finished product, what it would look like the next morning after it's all done. So we had a number of outcomes, three major outcomes related to the second objective, the scanning tour. We developed findings related to material properties, mixture and overlay design, laboratory testing, construction, field testing, and performance of PPC overlays. Based on these findings, we made specific recommendations regarding modulus of elasticity, bond beam, resin demand, aggregate quality, set time, compaction, hardness, bond strength, and skid resistance testing. And then based on these those recommendations, we made a number of improvements to the UDOT PPC specification. And I'm not going to read that whole list, but you can see that the list of, of updates and improvements to the UDOT PPC spec was quite extensive. Um, and, and this list is just the improvements that we made from the scanning tour alone. The third objective was to document a PPC field demonstration project. So we've up to this point, we've done the lit review. We've gone to California to see how they do it there, and, and we've learned a lot. The next step was to actually do a pilot project here in Utah. So this was based on the need for firsthand experience with PPC, as well as an opportunity for us to implement the recently revised specification at this point. Up to this point, there was no documentation of PPC field demonstration projects in the existing literature. So this field demonstration project consisted of a total of five placements. There were two test section placements and then three actual bridge deck overlay placements. Now, the reason that there were two test section placements, there was only originally supposed to be one, but the first placement was, was dry, or in other words, it had a low resin content. And so the contractor was required to then immediately place a second test section placement adjacent to the first one. And that second one was deemed to be satisfactory. And so the contractor was then able to proceed with, with the overlay placements. The three actual bridge deck overlay placements um, were placed on one uh, sort of quote unquote normal or conventionally prepared deck. And then the, the second and third placements were placed on two halves of a deck that had received hydro demolition prior to, prior to the overlay placement. So here's a picture of the two test section placements. It might be hard to, to delineate um, because they're right next to each other, but um, right here I'll just show with my cursor is the boundary between the two test section placements. So here's the first one they placed. Here was the second one. These are pretty small placements that are just in the shoulder uh, of, of the pavement there on, uh, on, the, on the 215 Salt Lake City. I wanted to show this, this schematic here just to demonstrate what the profile of a hydro demolished bridge deck would look like. In the schematic here on the left, we have what we might consider a conventionally prepared deck where we have the concrete deck on the bottom, and then a three-quarter inch overlay on the top. In the image on the right, the intention is the same, but with hydro demolition, it's it's difficult to impossible to, to exactly control the depth of, of concrete removal. Uh, hydro demolition, if, if you're not familiar, involves high pressure jets of water blasting the surface of the concrete, and it removes contaminated and unsound concrete from the surface. But you know, due to the variable nature of, of concrete, it's, it's going to remove that in a very sort of erratic way. And so the hydro demolition, if this dashed line represents the three quarter inch mark, um, but in reality, we're left with peaks and valleys where sometimes we get a valley where the hydro demolition goes too deep and a peak where it doesn't go quite deep enough. And so we're left with places where the overlay is, is therefore very thick 
or very thin and, and permeated or punctured by these uh, by these almost sharp peaks. So I just wanted to, to show that that was one of the things that we investigated uh, pretty extensively in this research. And so I just wanted to, to show that here. In this picture on the left, you can see this is an actual hydro demolished uh, bridge deck surface. In this case, the hydro demolition went all the way down to the top mat of the reinforcing steel in some cases. As you can see, there's some exposed rebar. And this is a, this is a bird's eye view of what that hydro demolished surface would look like with those, with those peaks and valleys in the surface. I also just wanted to show um, some pictures from the field demonstration project. Um, the process is similar to what they did at LAX. In the picture on the right, we've got workers that are sandblasting the surface of the deck. I'll also point out to you that we have some really rapid setting patch material that was used to patch some potholing that occurred in the decks. Um, I shouldn't say potholing, but some areas where the hydro demolition went way too deep. And so the deck needed to be patched with a, a rapid setting uh, patch material right before the overlay. And that was something that we looked at in our testing too, to see how those patches held up over time. But the main point of this picture is you can see the workers are just shot blasting or sand blasting in this case. Next, we have workers that are applying the primer, the priming agent. Uh, it's a, actually a methacrylate. And then finally, we've got some pictures that are some workers that are, that are uh, placing and finishing uh, a PPC overlay on a bridge deck. Again, here's a picture of, of the finished product, what it would look like when all is said and done. For objective three, we performed an extensive amount of, of testing in the field. We did hardness testing using a Schmidt rebound hammer, and we performed that on all five of the overlays, so the two section test section overlays as well as the three bridge deck overlays at the time of placement. And then we also did hardness testing on each of the bridge overlays two years after placement. We did skid resistance testing using a British pendulum tester on each of the bridge overlays two years after placement. We performed impact echo testing using a multi-channel air coupled impact echo device on each of the bridge overlays just before and also one month after placement. We performed vertical electrical impedance testing using a VEI apparatus on each of the bridge overlays just before and also two years after placement. So there were three major outcomes related to objective three. Number one is that we developed findings related to the construction, quality assurance, and performance of PPC overlays placed in Utah. This includes some never before published condition data um, related to the hardness, skid resistance, impact echo, and BEI testing. The second objective was the implementation of these innovative QA procedures, as well as the implementation of our, at this point, recently re revised specifications. Specification, I should say. And then the third outcome was that we were able to make recommendations regarding hardness testing, skid resistance testing, patching, bridge deck patching, and surface preparation of concrete bridge decks prior to receiving a PPC overlay. The fourth objective was to perform laboratory characterization of material properties of PPC. This was based on the need to characterize the properties of the field mix material. In other words, we, we actually collected samples from the field um, when, when those, uh, those demonstration project overlays were placed. We collected PPC from the field and then tested that in the lab. Again, this was unique because there's actually no documentation of field mix PPC in the literature. Plenty of papers have been written on lab mixed and lab tested, but we were testing in the lab what we, what we mixed in the field. And so that was a unique thing that we did here too. The laboratory testing involved density, modulus of, la modulus of elasticity, coefficient of thermal expansion, hardness, compressive strength, splitting tensile strength, rapid chloride permeability, and resin content testing. Due to the, the time limitations that we have, I'm not going to step through the procedures and results for each of these, but I just wanted to point out really quick two interesting things. The rapid chloride permeability testing showed that when PPC remains intact, it is 
totally impermeable to water and chloride ions. We, we found actually in all cases that zero coulombs of charge were passed through the samples. If, if, that, if, that, if you have any experience with rapid chloride permeability testing, you'll know that that's, that's as good as you can get. That's zero, zero permeability. The second uh, interesting thing I wanted to point out is that from the three bridge deck overlays that we tested, the resin contents were all with, within uh, less than 1% of the target. So in every case, the, the specified resin content was 12% resin. And the resin content was within less than a percent of that in all three cases. And so that was also a really encouraging finding. Again, without going into all the details, um, the outcomes of objective four is that we were to we were able to um, characterize the material properties of a field mix PPC. And one experiment that we did is we did different levels of consolidation. In other words, we rotted the cylinders um, a different number of times um, to, to perform an experiment to see if these properties were sensitive to that. In our research, none of the material properties that we measured were shown to be sensitive to the level of consolidation effort. Um, and that was really valuable to us because we, we were informed early on that PPC cylinders needed to be rotted a much lower number of times than conventional concrete cylinders. Um, but in our research, we did not find a significant difference in, in level of consolidation effort among the different properties. And, and so that was a really valuable finding for us in terms of sample preparation. The fifth objective was for us to revise the existing UDOT PPC specification. This, the, the need for an updated specification became even more apparent as we started into this research. We, we knew from the outset that it needed to be updated, um, but, but that need became, I think, even more and more apparent as, as the process went on. So, uh, you know, as, as, as you can see, it was really revised through an iterative process with UDOT. Um, this wasn't something that we did once, but this fifth objective was really accomplished throughout the entire process uh, in an iterative way. So this flow chart here just shows how the specification, kind of the progression of that revision. So we started with the initial specification. We then went on the scanning tour. From the scanning tour, we made a lot of revisions. We then performed the field demonstration project. From that, we made a additional revisions, and we've now arrived to where we are with the current specification. The last thing I want to do is just summarize the main contributions of this research as in terms of deliverables. This, this research has produced, um, well, let me, let me back up. I'll just quickly go through the main contribution of each objective, and then I'll go through the deliverables. The first objective, a synthesis of existing information about PPC bridge deck overlays. So in other words, the lit review. Objective two, findings and recommendations from the scanning tour and revisions to the spec. Objective three, findings and recommendations from the field demonstration project, um, as well as implementation of these QA procedures and the, and the revised spec. Objective four, characterization of material properties of PPC. Um, in other words, the lab testing that we did. And then objective five, the iteratively revised UDOT um, PPC specification. So I just wanted to, to highlight some of the deliverables or, or products that were produced as a result of this research. We had two journal submissions, um, two peer-reviewed peer -reviewed conference publications, and as well as the UDOT report that were a result of this research. That concludes my presentation, and um, Spencer and I will be happy to answer any questions that you all may have about this research. Yeah, thanks, Robert. We hope that the, the discussion can focus on your ideas regarding implementation now of the research and, and maybe the current status of the specification, progress with contractors, observations of your own about performance. So I just I just wanted to thank you guys. You did a great job. Um, 
it was a multi-year effort with a, a lot of uh, new nuances, breaking new new territory and, and testing for this. So great job. Um, before we get into what Spencer, you mentioned as kind of the state of, of the current practice with this, I did, I wanted to bring up one thing, Robert, um, when you were talking about the hydro demo project, um, you kind of made allusion that the hydro went too deep. And I just want to clarify that that's what it's supposed to do, right? The hydro is calibrated to a level that it removes all the, the soft concrete. So it wasn't right. an error, it was purposeful, but the challenge right. is then how do you fill those those areas that are so deep? So I just wanted to kind of clarify that for the yes, purpose thank, of the recording. <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I appreciate your clarification and, and sorry if I misspoke a little bit there. Um, that's that's absolutely correct. Um, Thanks. Thanks. Sure. Um, you know, James has been mainly involved now. He's kind of gotten dragged into our PPC. So I think he, he could probably speak to some specifics of, of how it's now moved forward on other projects, how those testing parameters that we've put into place are, are working. So James, do you mind taking on a little bit of that? Sure. I can just say, I guess, pretty briefly, um that you know we we have taken it forward we're, we're using it uh quite a bit at the moment um there were some questions on whether or not these test panels were to be used uh in a yard or on site and i, I like how you you were showing that you were doing things in the shoulders the it just sort of uh is part of that uh project limit um overall it is going pretty well um the the biggest difficulty we have right now uh, is in terms of tolerance uh, and, and getting that three quarter inch uh, overlay down. Um, three quarter inches is, is twice as thick as sort of a thin bonded, right? But when you're laying it down in a single layer uh, with a paver, uh, maintaining a tolerance is, is proving to be a little challenging. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure that out a little bit uh, right now. Um, but Overall, I think, yeah, the, the spec is working uh, and we're, we're just moving forward with it. No fear. I do have some other questions though, if I can ask some. Please, James, um, thanks for the summary too. We're, we appreciate that. UDOT right now is using some of these tests that have not been used by any other DOT. British Pendulum Tester, for example, for spot skid resistance testing and some of the early opening procedures. I'm glad to hear that those are those are working. So please, we'd like love to hear your, your uh, additional comments. Sure, and maybe I missed it, but you had also mentioned with the, the hydro. So there were sort of two things that you had, you had called out. Uh, you, you showed a really nice graphic that had those high and low points. Um, it, in, the, in the research where it did get too thin did that prove to be an issue or is, you know, was that roughened texture uh, acceptable even though we were sort of going back to tolerance, going less than uh, the tolerance that we would allow for a, a minimum thickness of, of polymer? Go ahead, Robert. Okay, yeah, great question. Thanks for asking that, James. Um, uh, this is outlined in a lot more detail in, in the report, um, but that is a really good question. So the roughened surface actually does provide a superior uh, surface for bonding to. And so from, from that standpoint, it's really good. But yeah, as I mentioned, if, if you have, you know, this three quarter inches that you're trying to remove and sometimes you're above that, sometimes you're far below, sometimes you're above. And as Cheryl mentioned, that is, I mean, that is the nature and, and really the purpose of hydro demolition is to, to remove the, uns, the unsound and to leave the sound. But, but the result is that you have these, so to, these peaks, so to speak, that, that leave a really, really thin surface. And what we found is that with our vertical electrical impedance testing, um, electrical impedance is actually a measure of the ability of an, of an electrical current to flow through something, but it, it's used as a surrogate um, for measuring bridge deck protection because the same elements that impede um, electrical flow also are also would impede 
um, flow of corrosive elements like water and, and salt and chloride ions and things like that. And so when we put a bridge deck overlay on, we would inspect to see an increase in impedance, which, which would apply an increase in bridge deck protection. In the case of the hydro demolished bridge deck overlays, we actually saw a decrease afterwards because what happens is that hydro makes that hydro demolition makes an increased level of porosity in the deck, um, which again would normally be counteracted by the presence of an overlay. That increase in porosity would would not normally be a drawback, but because those perforations um, made the overlay so thin and and likely even cracked, like produced like hairline cracking over those peaks. We sort of lost the protection over the overlay, and then with the increased porosity of of the deck from the hydro, we actually saw a, a drop in in impedance in those cases. And so, it, it, and again, we're we're not trying to bash in on hydro in any way, but the the recommendation that we made in the report was to combine that with a micro mill, so that we would at least get the three quarter inch coverage, and then below that you know, we could remove, you know, additional concrete that was unsound or contaminated. Um, and so it's kind of, we kind of get the best of both worlds. We get the minimum coverage that we need, um, but then also the benefits of hydro demolition, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you, yeah. And Spencer, I don't know if you want to add anything to that explanation there. No, I think that's exactly right. The There's always the... The, the issue related to billing also for the contractor's charges. And I remember there were some concerns about um, the excessive and somewhat unpredictable nature of the of the depth of removal for hydro demolition. And I think that was outside of our scope of work. Fortunately, um, Nick or others at UDOT handled those issues. But Cheryl, were you going to say something? Yeah, I, uh, before James went on to his next question, I was gonna say, if I recall, the other thing with the hydro is it produced not just the thin areas, but fins, fins in the concrete. Um, do you recall, did, did we have the contractor knock some of those thinner areas off? That's what I kind of remember. There were some just the, the pointier thin sections they knocked down. Um, I can't remember on this, the demonstration project that we were involved in was F562. Yeah, that's I the one I'm thinking. Okay, I don't recall them doing any kind of mechanical abrasion or... Well, I wouldn't... Like, <laughs> I, I think it was just some hammers on some high areas. <laughs> I don't think it was any kind of over, over deck. I think it was isolated, but I think that they did just some areas because the hydro created just not a, a depth issue, but a width issue in those depths. So they had these like vertical fins Mm -hmm. um, that they did kind of go through and just knock off before before putting the polyester on. But mm -hmm. but that's why we tried it. We learned a lot. Yes, we did. We sure did. So uh, another question I had um, relates to moisture content in the concrete. Um, so we have the hydro demolition process, uh, but not only that, uh, we have those patch areas, right, where rapid setting material is, is placed, uh, as is the nature with all construction work, um, time it gets the better of us. Uh, and when it comes to uh, waiting for things to dry, uh, we don't always get there. Um, were there any, any problems caused by, by maybe not letting things dry out as much as they would need to for the polyester and methacrylate to go down and really polymerize? Not, not that we measured, um, to my knowledge, and again, Spencer may want to weigh in, the, uh, in on this a little bit more, um, but we didn't see any problems with, with moisture content or with, you know, a lack of bond that would result from that. Um, you, you also mentioned that rapid setting patch material that we used to fill in some of the really low spots. Um, that was actually a concern for us, and that was a big purpose for doing that impact echo testing, which is a way of, of, of looking at delaminations from an acoustic perspective. And what we found was that those patches actually held up very well. Um, we, we were concerned that they, they hadn't had enough time to set up and that, you know, we just basically had brushed the process too much. Um, but what we found is that the um, there really were, two years later, um, 
no or hardly any delaminations in those decks that, that we looked at. And so we, we didn't find any evidence of, of moisture or, or the patches, for that matter, causing any problems. Can you remind and, me how long they were given uh, to, to cure before well, work continued? James, that they were still placing some of those patches when we arrived on the morning of the overlay placement itself. And in fact, when I was testing with the Schmidt hammer, would leave very marked indentations, oh. so green. And so we were we were really impressed that you could have <laughs> problems at all <laughs> from those. Say in your photo, it looked it looked kind of wet. <laughs> so. <laughs> it was. <laughs> those are my questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, and I think on that, I remember those discussions about those patches being green, but I think that's the, uh, uh, one of the things about the polyester is is the chemical makeup and the heat of it <laughs> help dry it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Are there any other questions or comments for us? Um, I've got one real quick. Um, Kind of, kind of general, I guess. Uh, I know that uh, James and Ryan both gave some uh, a list of comments or questions back to you during the report review. Uh, I think you got both of those lists. Did, did you were you able to um, address those in some of the updates to the final report, or were those were some of those things that we need to talk through here? Robert and I addressed each one of those in the final report, so it benefits from those comments that were provided. We appreciate receiving those and the time that you spent to, to look through them. Um, okay. We can also, David, send um, a response by email that would address how we talked about each one of those for a summary, if you think that would be helpful. I think that probably would be helpful. But, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Any any, any uh, idea or estimate of when the updated final report would be available? I expect it'll be available next week. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, the formatting is already finished. It's waiting for me to do a final check on. But um, And then I think, David, you assigned the report number correct after receiving it? Yes. Right, okay. I think that may be the only thing that we're missing on the front matter. Okay. Yeah, so we'll have it done very soon. Super. Thanks for the update on that. I, I think we, we all look forward to having that finalized and being able to share it internally as well as uh, with other state DOTs and, and uh, I guess just highlight the, the success of that research and what, 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 what we all learned, um, which leads me to another question. Uh, the So in the, in the report, I think you have – I don't remember exactly. Did you actually include a copy of the draft spec? Yes, you did. Okay. In the appendix. Right. So is that version essentially the same version that UDOT's using currently, or has UDOT since obtaining that maybe months or several, I don't know when that first came out, but has, has UDOT uh, done some revisions to that that may or may not want to go in the report now or should we just call that the draft and if the draft stays the draft and the current one stays the current in our pr practical uh, process here so there have been some revisions made to the spec i don't think the revisions if i'm remembering correctly anything happened to anything technical in the spec uh as as was stated it, it payment has been a challenge um and, and figuring out what how we handle overruns and that sort of thing. So there have been some adjustments in terms of uh, post overlay survey, for instance. Um, but the technical, the testing, uh, that's that all remains. Okay. Yeah. So my suggestion is just to kind of keep it and and make sure it's clear that it's a draft version, um, not necessarily the current version. Okay. Thank you. We can make sure that it's that we have text clearly stating that as the appendix is introduced. Great. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Ryan, I know, I know you had several questions. Do you have any you wanted to follow up on here in 
in kind of in person or in this meeting? Not really. I think they're kind of detailed, I guess. <laughs> uh, I think maybe maybe the one is, you know, it talked about in terms of quality assurance, um, the compaction testing, all those, and, and the way I guess Caltrans has been doing it, it's just a visual inspection. Uh, and and it's, you leave a thin film, but what, what, is, what does that really mean? It, it just seems very subjective, but I, but I mean, I guess my kind of, my question was kind of really like, has that been, and maybe it has been essentially proven repeatable and it's, and reliable if you get different inspectors. Robert, do you want to address that one? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and I, I think you're right. That is a pretty subjective description there. I think of adequate compaction. Um, the thing that we addressed in the report was that, well, I, I should say there's probably two kind of parts to the answer to this question. Um, I'll start with the thing that we addressed in the report, it was based on that they did this visual inspection and then they used a nuclear density gauge to get the the, the proctor, so to speak, the, the density value based on that. And then they would use that, but it, it seems sort of circular because it was like, well, this is based on visual inspection in the beginning. So then using a nuke gauge to say like what that that what that was. Now now the advantage of doing that is if there ever was a dispute between the inspector and the contractor, you could always come back and say, okay, well this this nuke gauge um, you know, was calibrated based on, you know, consensus from a number of different people or from the inspector or whatever. And and that's the number that we're gonna go with. Um, but to my knowledge, they just haven't had that problem in the field. Um, the inspectors who know what they're looking for can tell what that, you know, what an adequate resin content looks like just from visual inspection. And so our our thinking there, our thought process was, well, why not just cut out the the middleman that's based on visual inspection in the first place anyway? And like I said, there there could still be theoretically an advantage to using the gauge if there was a dispute. And, and we wanted to try to point to something that, you know, okay, well, this number is actually based on something that was looked at previously by someone else, kind of a thing. But um, sort of practically speaking, it, that doesn't seem to have been ever an issue that I'm aware of. Um, it, it seems like they've been able to, to characterize that pretty well from visual inspection. Yeah, that was our feeling too from Caltrans, the personnel there, when they demonstrated and the, Robert had a picture of it earlier, a little cup filled with PPC, and it had been subjected to vibration on a vibration table, and a certain amount of resin had, had flowed to the top, and it had a certain thickness. It was very easy to see that, and a comparison, like in contrast, where it was too dry and there was no resin, was very easy to detect. And so for them, it has been repeatable, and a contractor, is he, he has the same set of eyes, right? He can see it, there's either resin flushed to the top or there's not. And the same is true in the field. I was pleased to find out in our scanning tour that the resin can be added after the fact to a dry surface to try to seal it up better and prevent future raveling. But um, I think the idea of measuring compaction quantitatively on a layer that's variably thick is a challenge all by itself just from a theoretical point of view. So great, great question. Yeah, Ryan, great, great question. I mean, that's the basis for a lot of what, you know, Spencer and Robert were doing here is there was nothing for testing at all in the field. It was all based on experience. The way I like to say it is touch, taste, smell. Like they literally could just tell <laughs> um, it was right. And that was very hard to quantify. Um, that is one of the main reasons that we require the, the demonstration, the field test, because that really, as you could see on that one project where one was, the first test was really dry and the next one was better. You, once you see it done right, it is very apparent what's wrong. Um, and so that's, that's our goal with the, the trial um, is to make sure that they understand how they're mixing it and what it needs to look like when they go to the, to actually placing it on the structure. So so is there a training um, that these inspectors would get on each by like the supplier or? 
So wow. during that during the trial, that's what's supposed to happen. So there's a requirement for the manufacturer to be present. Um, and that's exactly what that's supposed to do. It's supposed to get everybody um, knowledgeable on the process, the testing, and what it looks like. In fact, several of the tests are passed off during the trial. They don't actually get repeated during the actual placement. So, but, but you're right, it, it's still somewhat subjective. Um, but we haven't found, I mean, as, as these guys showed, we, you know, haven't really found a better way at this point. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds like it's easy to tell then. So I guess that's kind of the, it's either good or it's not good. Great. Uh, good discussion there. Uh, another thought I had was, um, this is mainly because I'm kind of outside the structures group circle, but what is the, what does the decision tree look like for how to decide when to use PPC uh, as an overlay system instead of say uh, thin bonded uh, polymer overlay? I suppose, for you, yeah, I think Cheryl could probably address that one in most detail, but we in, in our discussions up to this point have thought that from an economics perspective, considering benefit cost ratios, that PPC may be best used in urban areas with heavy trafficking. Cheryl, would you like to add more detail? Yeah, that's exactly right. So right now, the way it is, is it's based on ADT. Um, and in other areas, we'll look at it and just see how remote it is, how hard it is to get back to do an overlay, and if it justifies the um, investment um, to do it. We'll also, you know, that's mainly for protection, but we are using it in cases for, um, for ride as well. You know, limited areas where we need to do ride correction. So. Okay. That sounds great. I know I've seen it a couple of places just driving around as a repair or failed thin bonded overlay. So, but I think it was also a correction, a little bit of a great, great correction or something. So sounds like it has a place in, in, you know, it has its place. Awesome. Any other questions before we wrap up? Any further research needed on this topic that we want to talk about or, or, or at least mention and plan to talk about more later. I'll mention one related to the spec and that is relating to frequency of testing on a bridge deck. That's probably something that could be visited again in the future. How many tests are needed right now. The spec is, is careful in that it allows the engineer to make selections about where and when to test, but there, there could be some adjustments to the written frequency of tests. Just to make sure that our tests are representative of the deck and that it's sufficient but not overly tested, for example. Good idea. I agree with that. I'd also like to add one. I'd like to put this in your in your bonnet, David, is to look at performance tracking for all these other places that we've placed it to start getting a feel for how it actually is performing. And with that, maybe a little bit more um, as we're doing the placements recording, uh, actually what's happening, you know, because a lot of times we get the data on how it performs, but we really don't know what happened in construction. So I think that would be a great extension of this. That's a good idea too. Okay. All right, any, any, any final comments, questions before we uh, wrap up our meeting? I'd like to just express appreciation to everybody again for your active involvement on the project. I think this one had elements of everything from theory to, to field work to construction and lab work and, and really an exhaustive search of the literature. And we really appreciate everybody's personal enthusiasm for the subject. I think that really added uh, a lot to the research quality and, and we're really pleased to, with the outcome. Great job. Yes, thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Guthrie and, and Robert, uh, both for 
uh, being with us today and presenting and also for all your hard and prof professional well done work on the research. Um, and thanks everyone for, for participating. Feel free to contact Dr. Guthrie if you have more questions. We'll look forward to the final report and we'll share that at that time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm.